Today we're lucky to feature both Jeff Vandermeer and his wife, Anne Vandermeer. My first introduction to Jeff's work was his Link story collection, City of Saints and Mad Men. You may know him best for his best-selling Southern Reach trilogy. First book in the series, Nebula Award-winning Annihilation, is currently being adapted into a film on track for release in 2018 by the Ex Machina guy. His new book is titled Born, the story about a city, a woman, a strange creature, and an enormous, lethal, flying bear. Like the best of his work, it explores our relationship with the environment, animals, and our indefinite but rapidly approaching future. It fully earns the nickname given to him by the New Yorker, the Weird Thoreau. Joining him today in conversation is, is his wife, Anne Vandermeer, the winner of the Hugo Award for her work editing the horror magazine Weird Tales. She's consistently championed stories that push the boundaries of what's possible in fiction. She and Jeff have collaborated on anthologies, including a big book of science fiction and, my favorite, The Weird. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff and Anne Vandermeer. I found Bourne on a sunny gunmetal day when the giant bear Mord came roving near our home. To me, Bourne was just salvage at first. I didn't know what Bourne would mean to us. I couldn't know that he would change everything. Bourne was not much to look at that first time, dark purple and about the size of my fist, clinging to Mord's fur like a half-closed sea anemone. I found him only because, beacon-like, he strobed green across the purple every half minute or so. Come close, I could smell the brine rising in a wave, and for a moment there was no ruined city around me, no search for food and water, no roving gangs. Instead, for a dangerous moment, this thing I'd found was from the tidal pools of my youth before I'd come to the city. I could smell the pressed flower twist of the salt and feel the wind, knew the chill of the water rippling over my feet. The long hunt for seashells, the gruff sound of my father's voice, the upward lilt of my mother's, the honey warmth of the sand engulfing my feet as I looked toward the horizon. If I had ever lived on an island, if that had ever been true. Around me, Maud's body rose and fell with the tremors of his breathing, and I bent at the knees to keep my balance, snoring and palsying in sleep, acting out a psychotic dream song. And there was born, defenseless. Names of people, of places, meant so little, and so he had stopped burdening others by seeking them. The map of the old horizon was like being haunted by a grotesque fairy tale, something that when voiced came out not as words, but as sounds in the aftermath of an atrocity. Anonymity amongst all the wreckage of the earth, this is what I sought. And a good pair of boots for when it got cold, and an old tin of soup half hidden in rubble. These things became blissful, how could names have power next to that? Yet still, I took him in, and I named him Born. So that is the beginning of Born. Uh, hello, DC. Um, <laughs> thank you for coming out in force today. I really appreciate it at uh, 1 o'clock on a Sunday. Um, and I will return to Born in a moment, but there are some uh, other things I need to deal with first, including thank yous. And I hope you will indulge me in a uh, moment of audience participation. You're a particularly photogenic audience today, and I'd like to have a record of that. Um, so if you would mind, uh, wouldn't mind, I'm going to take video of you. And if you wouldn't mind shouting out something for me. On prior tours, it's been I Blame Vandermeer. Um, but on this tour, <laughs> what I'd like you to shout out, if you don't mind, I'm, hopefully I can get most of you in this, but I'll at least hear your voices. Ba on the count of three, bears can't fly, or can they? <laughs> That's what I'd like. Ready? Count of three. I'll move back a little bit. Ready? One, two, three. Bears can't fly, or can they? All right, you sound a lot more um, upbeat about the possibility of bears flying the mini <laughs> than, than Minneapolis, where it was more like, um, or can they? <laughs> um, so the next thing I want to videotape you saying, it's going to take about half an hour to rehearse, so let's, let's get started here. I want you to say, uh, shout, polymorphous sentient invertebrates may bud rather than engage in live birthing procedures, okay? <laughs> no, not up for that? I, I, that's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I do want to thank some people before I continue, though. Um, first and foremost, of course, Politics and Prose for hosting this event, and I would like to personally thank 
one of the, the major booksellers and buyers here, Anton, uh, who has been a huge supporter of my work from the very, very, very beginning, which is, yeah, which is something that I most definitely will never forget. I'd also like to thank uh, my wife, Anne Vandermeer, uh, who will be in interrogating me in a bit, um, for coming along with me on what has often been a kind of carnival sideshow, as I think you're getting a sense of now, um, behind the scenes, and for not killing me yet. We've been on the road for 19 days, and we're on the road for another 20. Um, so you also have to tell me if I'm coherent still or if that's just my imagination. Um, so Born, uh, you know, I, I need to give you a little more context before I, I do my, my major reading from it. Uh, and you know, I hate doing that kind of summary. So I started out by drawing diagrams and discovered I'm really terrible at art, um, which is probably why I'm a writer, so I won't inflict those on you. Uh, but then I bought two stuffed animals that I thought would help because there's foxes and bears uh, in the in the book, um, and I thought this would help in terms of explaining explaining what was going on in the novel. Um, but as you can see, I bought a fox that's way too large and a bear that's way too small, and my arms are just not long enough to to make up for that in terms of lack of perspective. Uh, so these are now useless to me in some some regards. Um, but I'm going to throw them into the audience, um, and if you catch it and you bring it back to me uh, after the event, I will put something special in your copy of Born. Uh, so this is a trust issue. I, I really <laughs> trust all my readers. I trust that you're really nice, trustworthy people, and that I will get these, these fabulous items back. Uh, so one I will throw into the audience here, and then one I will just kind of like pitch one way or the other. <laughs> They're not in any way weighted, um, so you're not going to get hurt no matter what happens. So this, this has gone well most places. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> well, that worked out better than I thought. <laughs> but um, after that, I thought, you know, what do you do after you fail at, 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 at this, this, this kind of endeavor? And I thought, well, why don't I commission a giant woodcut of uh, more to uh, bring with me everywhere I go? What well, is kind of a reverse spinal tap situation <laughs> in that I thought it was going to be about six inches long and it's actually <laughs> two feet long. And Delta doesn't like it as a carry-on, um, <laughs> so we had to ship it to Chicago, our first uh, uh, tour event, and then buy special luggage for it that also includes geolocation device inside. And the kind of disturbing thing is that the luggage company has a little message where they say that if Delta or the airline loses it, their security team will descend on it wherever it is and retrieve it, um, which is a little too, <laughs> little too, um, you know, intense. But but it does mean that Theo Ellsworth will never lose this piece unless someone actually, you know, destroys it in some way. I would also say that uh, if you come up uh, during the signing portion, I'd love it if you would sign the back of it as a keepsake uh, of the tour. Um, there's quite a few interesting signatures on the back already. So, born. You may have gathered that there's a giant flying bear in Bourne uh, that is terrorizing the city of the future that uh, Rachel, the protagonist, lives in. And there are these little interfering foxes as well uh, that you may encounter. And of course, the character of Bourne who Rachel salvages as biotech that's been abandoned by this uh, place called the company. And Bourne begins to grow and grow. He begins to change shape and eventually to speak. And Rachel, although she survived in the city by great use of her instincts and wits just can't give him up even though that's what she should do she should either kick him out or give him to her boyfriend wick who wants to break born down into parts for his own biotech creations but she's become attached to born and especially so in the aftermath of an attack in her sanctuary uh, where she's beaten up and then born uh, drives away the attackers so what I'm gonna do is read the section where she's still recovering and because she's recovering she has to stay in her sanctuary called the the balcony cliffs instead of going out and doing more scavenging, and she gets to know Bourne better. Bourne made me happy, but happiness never made anyone less stupid. During my recovery, I had such trouble remembering what waited for me outside, as if I had to learn it all over again, despite having been taught so many lessons. All kinds of dangerous ideas entered my head while groggy. It was as if the little foxes and other animals out in the desert ran in circles around my mind, barking and kicking up dust, stopping only to stare at me from afar and encourage me to wander. I kept fantasizing that I lived in a real apartment in one of the stable sanctuaries from my past. Everything would be fine. I just had the flu or a cold and was out sick until I got better. 
And when I was better, what would I do? When I was better, I would go back to university and to some part-time job. I would complete my studies so I could become a writer. Because the ruined city was just a bad dream, and my life as a scavenger was a bad dream, and soon I would wake up, and the visions of almost drowning, of losing my parents, would prove to be an illusion too. But minds find ways to protect themselves, build fortifications, and some of those walls become traps. Even as I started to walk around my rooms with Bourne, even as I ventured out into the corridors, it was so sad a fantasy that I brushed by without recognition the revenants that told me it was a lie. Yet those weeks also contained some of my best memories because of Bourne. Wick was gone a lot, spying on his rivals, which left Bourne and me ever more time to explore. He'd gotten tired of being cooped up in the apartment. On days when I knew Wick would be out for hours, I'd take Bourne into the hallways, prickly with the fear of discovery and stiff from my slow healing wounds. It was all a construct by then, this game of not telling Wick that Bourne could talk. He had to know. But because I never admitted it and Wick never brought it up, Bourne became an open secret that existed between us like a monster all its own. It made me reckless, as if I wanted Wick to confront me, that somehow our relationship would be a total lie if Wick didn't confront me. Ignoring the strain, Bourne and I would race down dimlit corridors, Bourne afraid of colliding, congealing with the wall and tripping over his own pseudopods, wailing as he laughed, you're going too fast, or why is this fun? <laughs> Which made me laugh too. When you don't have to run and you have the chance to run for the hell of it, it becomes a strange luxury. Then we'd collapse at the end of the hall, and Bourne, in addition to his usual observation that he was hungry and needed a snack, would ask some of his questions. He never stopped asking them, as if he was really ravenous for the answers. This dust is so dry. Why is dust so dry? Doesn't it need some wet for balance? Then it's mud. What's mud? Wet dirt. I haven't seen mud yet. No, you haven't. Not yet. I would show Bourne a photo of a weasel in an old encyclopedia, and he'd point with an extended tentacle and say, Ooh, long mouse! which brought me quickly to the idea of teaching Bourne to read, except he picked that up on his own. When we played hide-and-seek, I'd sometimes find him hunched up on the edge of a midden of discarded books, two tentacles extending out from his sides to hold a book, and a single tentacle tipped with light curling down from the top of his head. He would study any number of topics and had no real preferences, his many eyes enthusiastically moving back and forth as he read the pages at a steady clip. I don't believe he needed light or eyes to read, but I know he liked to mimic what he saw me doing. Perhaps he even thought it was polite to seem to need light, to seem to need eyes. But the truth is, I don't really know what he thought or how he thought it, because most of the time I just had his questions. Eventually, I took him to Wick's swimming pool, which was Wick's laboratory. I loved the swimming pool, and perhaps that meant I loved Wick too, in a way. When the light from the hole in the ceiling was right, it formed green and gold waves across the pool, as if the moss and lichen on the surface had mingled with the sun's rays. It could take a while to get used to the melange of chemicals which gave off a dank smell, cut through with something spicy. That spice could be sweet or sour, but was always sharp. Eel-like things wriggled in the mire, and the fins of weird fish broke the surface, only to submerge again. What's a swimming pool, Born asked. A place where people go into to swim, but it's full of disgusting things. Disgusting things live in there. Just disgusting, really disgusting. Disgusting was a word Bourne had just picked up and used often. <laughs> well, just leave those disgusting things alone, Bourne, even if you are hungry. Bourne summarized for me. A swimming pool is a place where people like to swim in disgusting things. <laughs> Close enough, I said. You won't be encountering many of those when you're out in the real world. And then I wished I hadn't said it because I'd acknowledge that this wasn't the real world, that we lived in a bubble of space and time that, that just couldn't, wouldn't last. I, I took him out to the balconies on the cliff, too, but that was a little harder because I felt Bourne needed a disguise to be safe. I found a flower hat with just one bullet hole and a brown bloodstain to match. I found a pair of large designer sunglasses, I had the choice of putting him in a blue sheet or a black evening dress that I'd salvaged from a half-buried apartment. The evening dress was moth-eaten and had faded to more of a deep gray, but I chose it because I had nowhere to wear it and it was several sizes too big for me now. So Bourne reconfigured himself to be a little longer and less usual, uh, wide than usual, sucked in his stomach, more or less, and put on this ridiculous outfit. 
but it wasn't complete enough for him. What about shoes, he asked me, and I regretted having gone off on a rant about the value of a good pair of shoes a couple of days before. You don't need shoes. No one will see your feet. Probably no one would see him, period. Everyone wears shoes, he said, quoting me. Simply everyone. You even wear them to bed. It was true. I'd never gotten over having to sleep in the open so often. When you slept in the open in dangerous places, you never took off your shoes. Bourne really wanted shoes. He wanted the full ensemble. So I gave him shoes. I gave him my one extra pair, which were really boots, the ones I'd come to the city in. He made a great show of growing foot legs and with his hand arms reached down to put on his new shoes. From the aperture at the top of his head, muffled by the hat, came the words, we can go now. But if Bourne wanted the full ensemble, I wanted the full human. Not until you grow a mouth, I said, and a real face. Uh-oh, he said, because he'd forgotten. In those days, he always said, uh-oh, when he felt he'd made a mistake. Maybe he was also trying to be a little difficult, a concept he'd been field testing, usually in charming ways. The transformation only took a second. All of his eyes went away, then two popped up where appropriate, and a nose protrusion that looked more like the head of the lizard he had eaten a few hours earlier, <laughs> and a kind of crazy grinning mouth in that hat, in the black evening dress, in the boots. He looked so earnest that I wanted to hug him. I never understood for a second the gift I'd given Bourne. We went out on the balcony. Bourne pretended he couldn't see through his sunglasses and took them off. His new mouth formed a genuinely surprised O. Oh. It's beautiful, he exclaimed. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Another new word. The killing thing, the thing I could never get over, is that it was beautiful. It was so incredibly beautiful, and I'd never seen that before. In the strange dark sea blue of late afternoon, the river below splashing in lavender gold and orange up against the rock islands and their outcroppings of trees, the river looked amazing. The balcony cliffs in that light took on a luminous deep color that was almost black but not, almost blue but not, the jutting shadows solid and cool. Bourne didn't know it was all deadly, poisonous, truly disgusting. Maybe it wasn't to him. Maybe he could have swum in that river and come out unscathed. Maybe, too, I realized right then in that moment that I'd begun to love him. Because he didn't see the world like I saw the world. He didn't see the traps. Because he made me rethink even simple words like disgusting or beautiful. That was the moment I knew I decided to trade my safety for something else. That was the moment. And no matter what happened next, I had crossed over into another place. And the question wasn't who I should trust, but who should trust me. Thank you. Now, my lovely wife will interrogate me. <laughs> <laughs> and then we will do Q&A. Is this on? Yeah. Oy. We will perch here like birds. Test. Oy. <laughs> Testing. Ooh, OK. Yeah. Well, before we get started, I'm going to play something for y'all, and I am going to allow my husband afterwards to explain it to you, because our in conversation is going to be a series of explanations that he needs to give me, okay? <laughs> so, I'm going to put this up so that you can hear it to the microphone. Come on now. disturbing people who are not here for this event. <laughs> well? well? Well, that is Mord. Um, <laughs> But that's moored uh, by the novelist Benjen Benjamin Percy uh, in Minneapolis, and his real voice sounds remarkably like that. Um, so we had a, him do a version of Mord, and he was kind enough to let us uh, use it here. He, um, he was inspired by... He was inspired by the woodcut, yes. yes. So that, that's what that is about. <laughs> now, I was going to ask Jeff to explain the woodcut, 
but he's already explained it. So we don't need any more explanations. We know how this came about. Jeff is not good at math, so <laughs> when he was giving Theo the measurements, he thought that he was giving him measurements that would fit into the suitcase, but this is what we ended up with. And now it's got, it's got a special suitcase like Jeff was telling you, but there's also a portfolio that he needs for him to carry it around from event to event, along with the, um, the fox and the other bear. So, and and it, we're, we're just gathering more and more props as we move along. But speaking, speaking of um, explanations, I would like for you to explain, not only to me, but to everyone else here, why we currently have 27 bird feeders outside of our house. Well, there were two, two bird feeders uh, before the election. Um, <laughs> and, and there are now 27 because my personal form of stress relief every time I would get um, fragmented or frozen by the news, which was like 20 times a day, uh, was to put up another bird feeder or something else for the birds. Um, so there are 27 bird feeders in our in our back and front yard. The warblers, and or the adorblers as I call them, and the um, goldfinches uh, are very happy, or were until they left um, for the north. Um, and then uh, when I ran out of space for that, I found something called bark butter, which is really wonderful. Um, you can slather it on the trunks of trees, and warblers love it. Um, it's a little disconcerting for the neighbors because all they see you doing is massaging a tree with some substance <laughs> um, and uh, then also letting the lawn go to seeds so you can have more uh, wildflowers and stuff for the for the birds and other animals so I don't know what our neighbors think about this but it's been very stress relieving uh, for me uh, I did realize it had gotten a little obsessional when I told Anne as a joke that I was going to bring bird seed with me to feed birds on our tour if I happened to see any and she didn't know I was joking. So uh, at that point, I realized I might have gone down a rabbit hole. <laughs> well, speaking of, of Jeff telling me things that aren't true and pulling my <laughs> leg, when, when we first got together, he used to tell me wild stories all the time. And it took me a while to realize that he was just trying to amuse me with his stories. None of that stuff was true. He did not have a paper plate in his head <laughs> from, from the war in Grenada because, Gr Grenada because he was not in that war. and. And the hospital did not have enough money to put a steel plate, so he had a paper plate. But, you know, he told a lot of stories. <laughs> and um, he came into our household telling all kinds of stories. And at the time, um, my daughter, I think, was six or seven years old. And he used to tell her wild tales, a la Cal Calvin and Hobbes. And um, what he did not realize is he had met his opponent in her. <laughs> so I would like for him to explain to you the story of how my daughter punked him. This does actually apply to, to the novel. Um, you know, I entered a household where Aaron was uh, six or seven, and uh, and Anne, Anne and her family are Jewish, and, and I'm agnostic, and so I really wanted to learn more about Judaism, so I was very, very, you know, very open to learning about it, and we were in uh, the mall during Christmas, and there happened to be uh, a bear, a big kind of, you know, stuffed bear right next to the Santa Claus display, and, and Aaron and I were shopping for Anne, and uh, she pointed to it and said, oh, that's the Hanukkah bear, and I was like, <laughs> really, the, the Hanukkah bear? And tell me more about the Hanukkah bear. And so she went on for 20 or 30 minutes about the Hanukkah bear, its entire history, its provenance, the fact that there was there were constellations in the sky you could map to the Hanukkah bear, um, and so on and so forth. And it was pretty damn detailed, I must say. And um, and then the next week in synagogue, I went up to the rabbi, <laughs> and I I started going on and on about the Hanukkah bear and how wonderful the Hanukkah bear is this time of year, and he's giving me this look that is making me feel very confused and perhaps less confident. And then I look out of the corner of my eye and there's Aaron sitting on a chair, doubled over in <laughs> laughter. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I was thinking about that whole thing about a, a bear in the sky. And of course there is a real constellation, it's a bear in the sky. When I was writing this um, scene in Bourne that's a rooftop scene where Mord kind of goes across the night sky. Um, so some of that fed into there. And then a lot of Aaron stuff fed into early born, just early born, not later born. <laughs> um, but in, in early on when, like for example, the thing about long mouths, that's something that Erin said when she saw a ferret that was being led on a leash along a, a lake that we used to walk at, because uh, she didn't know what a ferret was. So I, I put a, a, a fair amount of that, and also Mr. R, our grandson, is in early born, because he actually auditioned for it when he learned I was writing this novel, and we were in Amsterdam and walking around, he would say, is this something Bourne would say? And he would say something ridiculous, and so on and so forth. 
It's just a family filled with things like that. Yes. Um, okay, a couple of other explanations. So we did talk a little bit about the birds in our yard. And just so that you all know, while we're traveling, we've been on the road for quite some time. My husband did hire somebody to come to our yard to continue feeding the birds because, God forbid, you know, the birds are going to starve to death but if someone's not coming to the yard to feed the, them. But the cat feeder doesn't know how to feed the birds, so the cat person. So it's, we have it's, to a have yeah. it's a different skill. It's a different skill. But but there's something else going on in our yard as well, which which I'm I'm I've heard many explanations from my husband, but I'm not satisfied with any of them yet. Maybe this one will satisfy you if he gives a good one this time. But we're also now my husband is now cultivating weeds in our yard, actual weeds to the point where he is watering them. So he's telling me that there's there's a reason for this whole plan, and and I still don't understand it. But I would really like for you to explain to me why we have weeds growing in our yard. Well, I did actually, as an experiment, um, have a Facebook page for one of our weeds. You can still go online on Facebook and find a page for Fred the Weed, which unfortunately someone cut down, and then so Fred had to come back as a seed. Um, but uh, but no, I, we, we our lawn basically uh, died, and then when we put it back in, um, they were telling us we have to use all these fungicides and things like that. And I just was like, I give up on this. This is not what we want to do. So I just let it be barren. And then within a month, we had clover, wildflowers, all kinds of things that came back in. And so now I'm determined that we'll have a natural lawn that will actually kind of feed the birds and provide more cover for the animals. I mean, we have um, possums, which I know some people think are very pesty, um, but they're very delicate, actually, the ones we have, at least, and very well behaved. Uh, raccoons that are wer very well behaved. Our squirrels are even well behaved. They're nothing like the northern squirrels that we encountered while living up north last semester, where I actually saw a squirrel take our bird feeder, throw it off the tree, <laughs> smash it in the middle of the road into little pieces, and then take all the seed out, and then smash it some more and then give me a look um, <laughs> so uh, so uh, yeah so the animals that were <laughs> that are coming in are, are very well behaved and and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm I'm working on making it a little less um, like a weed garden um, okay well I'm gonna take pictures when we get home and I'm gonna post it and then y'all can tell me what you think is he succeeding in his explanation is this a good idea do we need to continue watering the weeds do we need to name all of them they all have their own personas no, I, only I don't really one, know. I only named the one I'm a little bit concerned that the next novel is going to feature a talking plant. I don't know. Maybe her name will be Audrey. Um, <laughs> but, but you have always had a fondness for animals in your fiction. When you and I first met, you had a book called The Book of Frog that contained a bunch of um, short fiction that featured uh, frogs and some toads also. And then several of your other books that came out afterwards, you had different animals. You featured meerkats, you featured squid, you featured rabbits, now we have a giant flying bear. Um, what's next? Uh, hummingbirds and salamanders. Um, I have a novel that's called Hummingbird Salamander. And, uh, <laughs> And so it has hummingbirds and salamanders in it. Um, this woman uh, finds uh, is given a key to a storage unit that uh, by a dead woman that she thinks she doesn't know. And she goes to the storage unit, and there's a taxidermed hummingbird and a taxidermed uh, salamander in there that turn out to be from among the most uh, the rarest species on Earth. Um, so it's actually kind of unsettling. And she descends into kind of a, a, a web of eco-terrorism and, and wildlife trafficking. And that's what the novel is about. And it's ostensibly slightly near future, but not really. It's kind of like 10 seconds into the future. So it's hummingbirds and salamanders. Although I also have a YA series that features a talking marmot. Um, and on this tour, for some reason, I figured I would get bears. But no, people are anticipating. They're leapfrogging forward to the marmot because I have gotten two or three stuffed marmots at this point. Um, so now I have, I ha well, you have the stuffed animals, but now I have a bag of stuffed animals that I just carry around with me everywhere I go. It's better than a bag of heads, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, my husband definitely has an obsession with animals, and he likes to feature them in, in his books very prominently. But sometimes going along with the way that he does things, because he is a writer, and all writers are liars, but I mean that in the in the most positive way possible. He likes to create animals that don't exist, but they're, they're, they're close enough to reality that people are not sure. So um, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about some of the, the creatures that you've created and the kind of trouble that it put you in. Um, well, I, I think the one, the one you're really referring to is um, I created a, f a fake freshwater squid. I thought calling it a freshwater squid would be enough for people to know it was fake. Um, and it was kind of like uh, done as like an article about this festival, the freshwater squid in Sebring, Florida, because they didn't have a festival during the summer. So I thought they, they might 
welcome this in some way. Um, and uh, so that was posted online, and I thought, you know, it's in the fiction section, big deal. But um, I actually got an angry phone call a week later from a cephalopod expert at the University of Texas, Galveston, uh, who told me that I should stop making fake squid because um, taxonomy and real squid was difficult enough, and I was making it very his life very difficult. Um, <laughs> And uh, it just kind of snowballed from there. Uh, you know, it, it was quiet for a little bit, and then I heard from the Sebring Herald, I'm not kidding about this, uh, because about a year had gone by, and the Chamber of Commerce in Sebring had been getting some mighty strange phone calls about the Festival of the Freshwater Squid. <laughs> when, when is it? Uh, is it family friendly? Because um, it's described in detail in the story. And I had to do a, uh, a piece in the, uh, I had to do an interview with the Herald about, as they called it, the situation. Um, and then put non, you know, fiction, 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 more and more on on the actual piece. Uh, at which point I figured it was over with. But then a BBC wildlife producer emailed me from the Everglades saying that they thought they could come up to Sebring, and maybe film me walking around the lake talking about the squid. <laughs> and I was um, I was really tempted. I I knew someone I knew someone who had a had a, um, who could make a mold, a uh, plastic mold, and I knew someone with a scuba suit, and I thought maybe we could just pull this off if the water was murky enough. Uh, and then I, then I checked with Anne. I said no, because <laughs> I'm his editor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and so that, that, that was Nick's. And then the last thing, about three, three years later, was this Louisiana fisherman left a message on our machine saying that he'd seen a freshwater squid in Louisiana and he thought they were spreading up from Florida. And uh, if you can still type in freshwater squid and you'll find a listserv where he's frantically getting, trying to get people to tell him more about freshwater squid and w if they've also seen them. Um, so so I, 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 that's relevant in a way in that that's one of the first times I extensively wrote about kind of a, f a, a, a creature I in that way, in that biological way. And uh, some of the tactile elements of that kind of made their way into the character of Bourne, it's true, because I had to study squid quite extensively to get to that and was fascinated by the fact that they have like neurons in their tentacles, that their brains are distributed across their bodies, basically. Um, you know, things like that, so. So the last thing that I wanted to discuss with Jeff is um, I wanted to talk about this whole idea of our books dying. You know, Jeff and I have been um, on the road for almost a month now. We have almost another month to go. God, I hope We've not. been in very, very many amazing uh, bookstores and met all kinds of readers that love books. And yet, every now and then, someone will say, you know, is fiction important? What's the point? Are books important? Are there going to still be books in the future? So I wanted, I wanted you to talk a little bit about that and your thoughts on that. Well, I think it's quite interesting, um, and this, this I actually am on record as having said this, that I thought that the market for ebooks would top out a little bit, that the physical book itself, for, for just to talk about that for a second, is, is something that is so portable and so useful that it's, it's hard to see it being completely replaced by ebooks. And I think it's great to have an ecosystem where, a book ecosystem where we have all of those things, but I, I think it's quite fascinating that physical books are making a comeback, and that's, of course, very important to indie bookstores, which I think are you know, really the life's blood of, of, of culture in this country when it comes to books. Um, I know also that in talking to booksellers, uh, they've said, they've told me, James Crossley, a bookseller from Seattle, told me that the last three years at the conferences he goes to with, with independent booksellers, he's seen more upbeat people than he's ever seen before. You know, booksellers by nature, you know, book people are, are always aware of the fact that movies and other things are, are, are seemingly at a certain magnitude above above what we do in terms of the audience, but um, I've seen a lot of upbeat people. I've seen a lot of publishers who are adapting to very changing situations and doing a good job with it. Um, so I'm actually very confident about that. I'm also confident that in the current political s uh, atmosphere that you know, if we, if we don't just indulge in straight on satire, which I think is kind of dead at this point because the real world is just too, it's too satirical every day to keep up with, um, but I think there's a lot of ways in which the laboratories of the laboratory of fiction can be really useful in talking about what we're going through, um, exploring avenues of resistance and things like that. So I'm, I'm actually fairly upbeat about all that, <laughs> even in the midst of all the other things that make me put up bird feeders. So fiction is still important. So keep writing it, keep reading it. And I think at this point we're going to open up questions to the audience. And do we need a mic for that for the for the audience members, or are we? Okay, yeah. If possible, if you can stand at a mic, that'd be great, just because they are videotaping this too, so. Good, you have questions. Usually I have to pry them out of the audience. That's good, maybe. We'll see. 
<laughs> oh, wait, wait, where are we starting? Start here. Okay. So this just came to me when you mentioned the uh, squid somewhat nature of uh, born and um, the distribution of the neurons. Were you at all thinking at all in terms of uh, somewhat of what Peter Watts had done in blind sight with um, the distributed consciousness or, or lack of consciousness in his aliens in their processing? Because that kind of popped into my head when you mentioned it because he does that very interesting uh, sort of intelligence without consciousness approach. I was just wondering if that had popped into your mind at all when you were thinking about Bourne and his sort of neuron situation. Yeah, a lot of people have recommended Peter Watts to me, and I really haven't delved into him yet. Um, I think that there's there are a lot of writers who are exploring weird biology and the, the, the frontiers of biology and animal behavior and, and, and neurological science, and I think that's really where it comes from, is that there's, there's a few of us who are exploring that and then kind of extrapolating forward um, in Born, of course, it's more of a fantastical situation. It's kind of science fiction by way of fantasy, in the same way that the Southern Reach books w were basically science fiction by way of the uncanny. Um, so it's a good question, though. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, um, I was uh, wondering about your um, the I guess the length of writing process because I feel like I've been hearing via your blog or other sources about born for years and but um i know you came out with the um the seven reach books um i think on a much shorter time scale so i was just kind of curious about some of your ideas because i know um uh you the uh, the journals of dr mormick are I, I guess coming out eventually but i remember reading that on your on your blog like five years ago i usually have like five or six things going at once and it's just a matter of of, of what i'm feeling in the moment with born there were a lot of things about the parental situation i had to really think about i had to really think about what it had been to, like especially for the early parts with born to be a step parent i had to really think about the dynamics of the city um, and so my usual process is a novel usually takes anywhere from five to eight years for me and i think about it a lot before i put a lot on the page it's just that i sometimes am pegged as being prolific just because the projects after all that time just seem to all come together at once. <laughs> um, and it's true that Annihilation was a slightly different process. Uh, so I have been working on on some parts of Born, but I wrote I wrote pretty much 80 to 90,000 words of the 100,000 from 2015 on. Um, and I was really looking for the right entry point, the right distance. I wrote a, pr a proto born story called S The Situation, which has some of the same characters, but with different details of their lives and history. So it's like from an alternate universe. And so I had to get that out of my head as well, because that was a satirical story, and it didn't really fit with what I wanted to do with this novel. Um, so yeah, they leapfrog each other. I also field tested Mord uh, on my Facebook by doing a, a, a bare icon from my profile page and then in all caps pretending to be moored in third person and talking about s you know sw uh, slapping people's heads off and stuff and uh, it was Bag weird because people would actually respond to Mord as if as if he was real and be offended that, that he was talking to them this way it was just very strange but it allowed me to get into Mord's head a bit um, in a weird way <laughs> Hi, welcome to DC. Oh, thanks. Um, I want to ask a question about your freshwater squid story, <laughs> yeah. and how you feel about having contributed to the explosion of fake news. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> well, this was Explain back yourself. in this was back in 2007. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so at that point, it wasn't really doing much damage to the fabric of the universe. Um, <laughs> Um, I actually would probably be a lot more hesitant to engage in that kind of activity because there was also s also some satirical elements, even though it has nothing to do with politics, um, except, of course, now the environment is very front and center in politics in general. Um, but that's a hilarious question. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for putting him on the spot. I appreciate that. <laughs> she lives for the look of alarm on my face. <laughs> Hi. Um, you mentioned that you had spent a semester in upstate New York at yeah, Hobart yeah. in Geneva. Yeah, yeah. And I was just curious if the change in environment, ecology, influenced uh, some aspect of Bourne or your forthcoming work. Definitely the forthcoming work. A hummingbird salamander. The salamander is a, a, an organism from upstate New York, and a biologist from Hobart and William Smith is actually creating that creature for me because what I want is to have... 
not created it myself so I can react to whatever she comes back with uh, to me and maybe new ideas will come to me about what that creature means in the text. I would also say that it was really fascinating to see the patchwork of compromise that hunters, farmers, and uh, ecologists had formed to preserve green spaces up there. I mean, it's certainly not the ideal wilderness, but the fact of the matter is that a lot of animals are able to thrive because of those compromises. And one of the most terrible things about the whole uh, Malheur uh, refuge uh, thing out in Oregon was that they had also reached compromises up there before those rogue uh, ranchers came up and took over. They had reached a compromise that was working for everyone. And so um, I guess uh, seeing that firsthand in upstate New York, in certain areas at least, uh, made me very... um, much more hopeful about the ability for everyone to get along enough to save some of the environment we have left. Thanks. Uh, you wrote about a, a psychopathic bear named Mord in a short story yeah. years ago uh, who vanished at the end of that short story, and Mord vanishes at the end of Warren. Yeah. Uh, not to give that away, but. Uh, <laughs> oh! <laughs> uh, you didn't wow. hear that. <laughs> <We're>, spoiler. <laughs> Will there be more of Mord? Uh, appearing in other worlds to come? Do we have more of... No comment. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) You take Uh, him first. uh, Well, there's more questions here, though, right? Are you in line or not? Uh, No, you're not. Okay. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, politics and genre fiction. Uh, This kind of came to me because for the science fiction club here uh, we've been reading this book here Moten mm-hmm. God's Eye and it strikes me that this book could only have been written as a deliberately regressive book because it came out in 74 and not only is every character in this book except for one in the aliens not only white but obviously Anglo in the sense of they all have British names and it, it's I, I won't go into everything about it but it's it, these, this, it seems to me that a lot of this, this stuff about the politics of the of genre fiction goes back. It's nothing new. It's stuff that's been going on for forty plus years. And I know that that both of you have been involved in editing stuff that's inherently political. Some of the feminist antho- science fiction anthologies. So I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about some of that. I think that our personal approach, and Anne can tell me if I'm wrong about this, is um, to ignore all the bullshit and um, do our own thing and try to champion the voices that we think are interesting and important, and that those are very diverse voices from all over the world. Um, our personal approach uh, may be possible just because of the fact that we do these massive anthologies and we can we can do that, and we don't have to engage in some cases where there are other writers who are forced to engage, sometimes by their very identity. Um, But we also are very conscious of of when we talk about this, not wanting to render other voices talking about it invisible, if that makes any sense. Uh, So we're more likely to, like on Twitter, more likely to to retweet something someone else is saying about these issues than to offer my own opinion. Um, But we do think it's it's changing because there's a lot more, well, just simply there's a lot more non-white writers in the field right now than than there ever were before. And that, has, that makes a huge difference, not just in terms of representation, but about the things that are being talked about. Um, and so that, that makes us hopeful. And then um, right now, we just, um, to be absolutely honest and blunt, our business plan includes these particular regressive gatekeepers don't get the book till it's six months out. You know? So. No, I'm a firm believer in um, reaching out and trying to make all of our projects look like the world that we live in, which means the entire world, not just pockets of it. And I, as an editor, the reason why I got into editing is because I like to cheerlead writers. I am not a writer by any stretch of the imagination, and, and I would rather that the stories that I publish, the writers that I publish, let their voices speak for themselves instead of me saying something about it. I will put them together, and I will give them to you so that you can see that, so that you can read their words, so that you can hear what they're saying. That's my job. It's your job to read those things. And I I try to find as much diversity from all over the world, which is one of the reasons why a lot of the projects that Jeff and I work on contain a lot of translated works, much of it translated for the first time. And we're going to continue to do that in the future. And also one thing we found with these huge anthologies like the Big Book of Science Fiction and The Weird is publishers only really need 10 to 20 like huge names to sell an anthology. So when you do a huge book like that where you have 80 to 100 contributors that you're then free to wander where you will 
and to explore the things you think are really important without thinking about the commercial or market considerations because the book will still sell on the basis of those iconic names that you would probably put in, you will put in anyway, um, but they don't have to drive the conversation. Like with the big book of science fiction, we were very much aware that we were trying to retool the canon um, in part because most science fiction anthologies of this kind contain the same writers over and over and over again, sometimes with the same stories, and we wanted to challenge that a little bit. We think it's better when there are books that try to challenge that along with the ones that are more traditional. You know, there's nothing wrong with being more traditional, but if it's the only game in town, it begins to become repressive in a way. Nothing makes me happier than when a reader comes up to me, someone who's picked up one of our books, and says, I never knew about so-and-so writer. I never knew about this person. Sometimes it's actually even a writer that's in the anthology saying, I never heard of this person. Now I must seek out all their work. Nothing makes me happier than that when they're able to find what I found and love it just as much as I do. So on that note, um, I'm a huge fan of your anthology work collectively. Thank and you. I was wondering, um, this is actually kind of a big ask, but if off the top of your head you can name like two or three authors you think would deserve more recognition, possibly from outside the US if possible. Okay, I want to talk about one writer who is, is um, someone I care about very much. Her name is Karin Tidbeck. She's a Swedish writer. Um, we published a short story collection of hers several years ago. She was also one of our students at Clarion, but she has a new novel coming out next month. It's called Amatka, and it came out in Sweden first, but she translated into English, so it is translated, and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's a beautiful book. I love it so much, and I, I don't want it to disappear because nobody knows who she is, so I'm, I'm going to champion Karin Tidbeck. Great. Amatka, look for that book. It's coming out from Vintage next month. And uh, Merce Rotoreda, a Catalan writer uh, who's been translated now over the last 10 years more extensively and writes sometimes in a fantastic go register and, and had periods of time when she was forbidden for writing in her to write in her own language is an absolutely amazing and fantastical and often the fantastical is also political in her work. Here in the US I think one of the most important voices is Kai Ashante Wilson. Um, I think he's absolutely freaking brilliant and I think he's gonna change the landscape. Anne has a story from him coming out on tour.com that's brutal but very June necessary. June twenty eighth. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions? Concerns? You sure? Am I going to get the Did bear and the Did he explain everything? <laughs> All right. We can go to the signing. I'm going to sign up here. I okay, hope you'll thank get you a very chance much. to sign the, uh, the bear. Thank you.